My name is Lalu Davies Yemitin, and you're listening to My Brother Podcast. The global communications industry continues to grow and expand. We've gone from basic communications to really being in an era where it's all about telecommunications. And then with all the advancements of technology, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and all the many fascinating things that have been ongoing. An industry uh, that continues to grow and a company that's been on the forefront uh, is what my guest today uh, is where essentially he spent the entirety of his career. Xavier, thank you so much for making yourself available. So excited to have you on the podcast and to have you share your story. So let's just dive right into it. Why did you start by giving us a little bit um, about your background? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, this, this by far will be the best part of my day. So let me say that up front. But uh, <laughs> hey, i uh native of Washington, D.C., um, currently reside in the Dallas, Texas area where I work with AT&T. I uh, currently am the uh, president of our uh, public sector and uh, FirstNet business. FirstNet is related to the uh, first responders, public safety net, uh, public safety uh, business. So um, happily married. Uh, we literally had our uh, 28th wedding anniversary this past weekend. Uh, two kids, uh, daughter that's up at Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, son that's going into 10th grade. So uh, just, you know, just a regular guy trying to make it in life just like everyone else. Yeah, here, here. And so Washington, D.C. is absolutely one of my favorite uh, cities in the world. Uh, so glad to hear that your daughter is back there at Howard. But I want yes. you to take us back to Washington, D.C., and the Williams household, what was it like uh, during the early years of your upbringing? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I'm very fortunate. I grew up in a, a two parent household. Um, my father was an entrepreneur. Um, my mother uh, still living is an educator and eventually became an, admin an administrator where she was the uh, principal in the D.C. public school. So um, very interesting juxtapose in how I was raised by two parents. Um, have an older brother and sister, and uh, I don't know if you got older siblings. They beat me up, took my food. You know, they were good brothers and sisters, but, you know, they, they could do whatever they wanted to me, but nobody else can touch the baby boy. So I was the baby in the family, um, was taught from an early age that ex a lot was expected from me. Um, a lot's been bestowed on me, so a lot was expected from me. And uh, uh, like I said, grew up in an area where um, you know, my father was very much a risk taker being an entrepreneur. My mother, uh, being an educator was, it was very structured. Uh, we needed to always have a homework done on time and correct. So, uh, this is a pretty cool upbringing. Also, uh, you know, played basketball a lot, um, played all the way through college. So, uh, there was always a basketball around, always a lot of friends and family around and just those types of things. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely sounds like you were blessed not to just have, you know, both parents in the household, but in a sense, the best of both worlds. Okay. Uh, your mom with the structure and is an educator and I'm sure a disciplinarian. But then your father, who's this, you know, willing risk taker and being out there and being in the world and having it, yes. in a sense, eat what it kills. Yes. Uh, so that's that's always a blessing to hear. Now, what was it like as you other than having your older siblings uh, roughing you up from time to time. <laughs> I, I'm sure at some point it was also great to have them as your protector. So talk us through sort of your middle school through high school years. What was that experience like? Yeah, so it was very interesting. I uh, I went to a military high school of all things. So if anybody's familiar with Washington, D.C., I went to uh, uh, St. John's College High School. So I uh, went there from seventh to twelfth grade. So my middle school years, uh, always wore a shirt and tie from seventh grade on. Um, with it, it was sort of interesting, especially in the military, and it was a military Catholic school. So literally, uh, one period it was love your brother. The next period it was kill your enemy. So it was, you know, as a, as a young kid forming your thoughts around things, it was always interesting uh, hearing those types of messages. Um, but, you know, it was it was very interesting because it was multicultural one. Um, I mentioned I played sports earlier, so there was always the premium placed on being an athlete. But it was important. And I learned at an early 
uh, early age, you know, the importance of being a student athlete. So, you know, my mom's was very much clear, no grades, no play. So that was one. But in the exact same vein, when you came uh, from the neighborhood I came from, you had better have some game and be able to play and be able to represent. So, um, you know, growing up, I had a great group of friends. All of them were um, very similar situated where um, we didn't know if we were poor. We didn't know if we were rich. We knew we had everything that we needed in front of us. And we just went out and, you know, learned how to live life, have dreams and all those different types of things that hopefully uh, I'm able to pass on to my kids. Yeah, wonderful. So you, I presume you played basketball competitively um, yes. in high school. Okay. Yes. Good deal. And so what was the transition like from high school uh, to your decision about where you were going to go to attend university? Yeah, that was that's a great question. For me, it was it was very interesting because one, um, the question was, did I want to keep playing basketball? So um, at that time, uh, my two best friends, my best boy and the young lady I was dating at the time went to North Carolina A&T. Um, I went to school in Northwest Pennsylvania, a school named Edinburgh to play basketball. So, you know, I, I at that time I said, you know, I might need to take a different path than the path that my friends are taking. Now, um, what this school offered me, it was very interesting. I mentioned the balance between athletics and uh, uh, academics earlier. The school I went to offered me both an athletic and an academic scholarship and um, you know, look, just like every young kid, I wanted to make my mother happy. So that was, uh, you know, an opportunity for me to, you know, make sure that I was going to school to also to pay attention to my books and not just going to be an athlete. Um, one of the things that the best thing I could say about my experiences at Edinburgh, I know I went to school there as a boy and I know I left as a man. So it was a great four years of experience. I got to uh, see a lot of different things, including snow that I had never seen before. I mean, it, it was a place where it wasn't uncommon that there was three or four feet of snow on the ground and you still had class and, you know, going to school in 10 and 15 degree weather. So it was uh, quite a formidable, formidable experience learning uh, a lot about myself, learning a lot about uh, other people and just had a good time in college. It's funny. I'm sure someone will listen and say, he grew up in D.C. What does it mean? Snow. It's a different type of snow in northern. It's a different type of snow. And in, 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 this is a true story. Um, the school I went to, I was recruited there on a happenstance day in February. There was a chance of snow. And if you know anything about Washington, D.C., if there's a chance of so schools might be closed. Um, chance of snow. I think we got less than an inch of snow. Um, schools were closed. The guy who was recruiting for Edinburgh happened to be in town that day. And because I did not have school that day, I could go to the gym and get a workout in. And that's how this coach found me. So, uh, yeah, snow means a lot to me. <laughs> snow yeah. means it's set, it's set in stone. It set my life in many different areas. Yeah. So you, you made a comment that you went to uh, school in Edinburgh, a boy, and came out a man. Yes, so talk to us a bit about what was that four-year college experience like? Yeah, so um, one, um, you know, I mentioned I grew up in a very structured household. Um, but when you go to college, you're out on your own, and you got to make decisions about, you know, when you go to class, who you hang with, uh, how you party, how you don't party who your friends are, all those different types of things. So um, on top of that, playing sports, I had to make sure that I worked out. I had to make sure I kept the schedule up with the uh, tutors and uh, things like that. So um, very much in my freshman year, I had to take a lot of the structure that was given to me and, and parlay that and transfer that into school. And I was able to do good in my first semester and that allowed me to lay the foundation for a uh, strong performance during the course of uh, the four years. Further, was able to uh, pledge a fraternity. That taught me a lot, taught me a lot about fortitude, taught me a lot about commitment, taught me a lot of different things that uh, are still the foundation of who I am today. So 
Um, yeah, I, I, as I said, came a boy, left a man, and I'm very proud of the experiences that I had there. Yeah. And what was your major and how did you select that major? Yeah, I, uh, I chose uh, business administration um, and also mathematics. So business administration, it was very simple. Um, I mentioned earlier, my father was an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be a businessman. Every day I watched my father get up and put on a suit and a tie. And, you know, a lot of us want to emulate our fathers. So that's what I wanted to study. But I also was uh, uh, have always been pretty good with numbers. So uh, also uh, studied mathematics when I was in school because um, a lot of my friends at the time wanted to be engineers. So I said, you know, as a backup plan, let me make sure I got some type of science in my background. So I studied mathematics also. Yeah, and that's an important distinction to make because it's not, that's not a normal combination that you see with people, right? right. You right. know, it's not not like it's left brain, right brain thing, but when you're in the liberal arts program, so to speak, or or you pursue something like business, you knew you had the, the interest and the aptitude, but you know, what led to that decision other than, I mean, what was that thing that said, hey, let me have this as a backup plan, mm -hmm. especially as a young person, you don't have the benefit of foresight mm -hmm. to see what implication that decision mm -hmm. might have had. So do, any yeah. sense of why you, you know, reached that conclusion? I think I think uh, one thing, and I've been very fortunate, people have always encouraged me to follow not only the things I'm good at, but the things that I dream about. And with math, not only, I, you know, I was good at it, so people encouraged me to go and understand more about algebra, understand more about calculus and what are the practical applications of it. So when you when 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 you pour into a young person, it comes out and pays and pays out in spades. And I think I'm an example of that where I mentioned from a business standpoint, it was just seeing my father do that and wanting to emulate my father. But then there were people around me who always encouraged me around math and other in sciences and things like that. Um, I, I, on all jokes aside, where I went to school, I probably would have majored in engineering if it offered that major, but they didn't offer it. So I think it was a combination of be, wanting to be a businessman and just wanting to make sure I did something related to science that really drove me towards mathematics. Yeah, yeah. So after college, uh, what happens next? Uh, funny story. Um, I wasn't ready to go to work. <laughs> so I literally went back to school and got my MBA, um, went to the University of Pittsburgh. And if I had a little more seasoning, I don't know if I would have made that decision. It was, it, this is a funny thing, probably the best decision I ever made, but it was probably an ill-informed decision because um, one, um, you know, it's probably a good thing to get some work experience before you go get your master's degree. So I think that's one. Secondly, uh, at the time, the University of Pittsburgh offered an 11 month MBA program. So while it may sound sexy, being 22 years old with an MBA and no work experience is not a really good combination. It is not a good combination at all, because every entry level job you're probably overqualified for every job that a typical MBA would get. I don't have the work experience to get it. So mm -hmm. um, it was, again, it was a really good learning experience for me. And I uh, was able to make uh, lemonade out of lemons afterwards. But um, yeah, for anybody who I, you know, mentor or coach now, I'm like, you know, work a couple of years before you go get your master's degree, unless you just don't think you're ready to go to uh, go to work yet. And I was in that situation where I wasn't really ready to go to work yet. Yeah, and I think that's important. So the I'm Nigerian, and you know the the running joke is either if you're Nigerian, if you don't have three jobs, and if you don't have a PhD by the time you're 26, it's like what's wrong? Where did this uh, apple fall far from the tree? Right. So so and there's that inclination where people say, hey, go to school and get an education, but it's important as you've observed that especially with something uh, with a focus like an MBA degree, where it's not just like a check the box degree. It's a degree that's uh, really spe specifically geared towards yes. a, a certain set of skills that hopefully help you enhance your career when you obtain it. So I think it's important that people do know uh, when they choose to pursue uh, furthering their education, what specific objective sure. outcome they're, 
that they're seeking. So, so you do 11 months in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, which I'm sure is just as cold as Northern Pennsylvania. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so how do you finally armed with a master's degree, uh, launch yourself into the workforce? Yeah, I, uh, there were three companies that were recruiting me, or I don't know if I was recruiting them, but, um, I looked at, uh, HP Hewlett Packard. Yeah. out in Boise, Idaho. Um, nothing against Boise, but that wasn't the place for a young black man to live, at, at least for me. Um, looked at Ford Motor Company in Detroit and looked at AT&T and uh, decided on working at AT&T. I was very fascinated in uh, uh, information technology. So when I went to get my MBA, I uh, majored in finance with a concentration in uh, what was then called management information systems. Yeah. Now we call it this IT or information technology. <laughs> but, um, you know, this new burgeoning technology and all this great stuff was coming out. And I was uh, very fortunate to uh, go work at AT&T and catch the wave of that and really uh, grow in the global communications world. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned Ford, I think about what the auto industry uh, has experienced over really the last uh, almost decade and a half. Yep. Uh, I think AT and T, you know, not just turning out to be a, a very good personal choice. I think industry wise, uh, <laughs> it's proven itself to be quite yeah. uh, resilient. So you take this job in AT and T. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have to relocate, and what position did you start in with the company? Yeah, I uh, moved from uh, Pittsburgh. Um, went to D.C. for the summer uh, where I grew up and then moved to uh, Central New Jersey, a place named uh, Eatontown, New Jersey. So if anybody's in the military, they might have heard of Fort Monmouth. Um, so that town, um, my first job was as a financial analyst in what was then called ATT Bell Laboratory. So Bell Labs was uh, the preeminent uh, R&D organization in the world. And I was a financial analyst or cost accountant in that organization. Got it. And how long did you spend in that position and sort of how did your career start to grow uh, from there? Yeah, I uh, when, when I started, I had a I still have a good friend. Uh, his name is Robert West. And he said, you know, your first job, you want to develop eating skills. And I was like, you know, look, I'm real good at eating. What are you talking about? And he said, no, it's like building a house, build a foundation of eating skills so you can make sure once you built this foundation you could go do other things and if you fail you could always fall back and make sure that you could feed your family got it so the first five years of my career i stayed in financial uh related jobs so i actually got promoted two or three times but it was always in the financial analyst uh space in bell laboratories and then i actually moved into uh, uh product management because um when I started looking at the executives in AT&T, they all had uh, sales and customer facing experience. And starting in finance, I didn't think I could get from finance to sales. So product management was that, uh, you know, that bridge to get over to sales. And at the time, I uh, uh, was very fortunate to go become a financial, I mean, a, a product manager, uh, actually a business analyst for this technology that was new and emerging then. It was called Frame Relay. And, you know, it's something that people are very aware of now, Frame Relay and ATM technologies, but it was brand new then. Um, went into a business that was growing triple digits every year. Um, so was able to go and catch that wave and uh, grow nicely in um, product management. From there, I was able to get into sales um, I don't know if sales like me or I liked it, but I did pretty well in it, uh, moved around. And over the years, um, my wife and I, we've moved 10 or 11 times with the company. So started in finance, moved to product management, was eventually able to move into sales and then moved into a lot of executive uh, type roles where uh, I've been very fortunate to have worked in HR, worked in customer service worked in sales and worked in a lot of different organizations where now I actually run a P&L uh, and have been doing that probably for the last five to 10 years of my life doing P&L type jobs.
Yeah, yeah. You you talked about the importance of building that foundation. Mm -hmm. It goes without saying, and different people describe it differently, where it's like it's about skills acquisition. Mm -hmm. And obviously, depending on what kind of industry you're in uh, and, and how you carve out those opportunities, where there's some elements, because, you know, as you're describing this, it's like, oh, man, this guy had the right sense of timing and what he needed to do. And he understood, hey, if you're going to bridge the gap from being a financial analyst uh, to being more um, essentially a, the customer facing side of the business, if I could describe it that way, um, you know, you thought through that process and reason that this was it. Mm -hmm. But how did you I mean, how, was this just intuitively did you have mentors who were providing the kind of guidance for you at that phase of your career yeah, yeah i uh so i've always had people around me some mentors but I've always had people around me that i could use as a sounding board the most important thing for me was and i still do it today um it started when i was younger i always had a five-year goal and i would reverse engineer how do you get to that goal so if i wanted to uh, when I started in finance, I mentioned my five year goal was to develop eating skills and build a foundation of what I was trying to achieve. That next tranche of that next five years was get to sales. And when I said the goal was get to sales and reverse engineer it, I, I did not see many people who could jump from finance to sales. So there had to be that interim step. And when I went and spoke with people, they were like, well, you know, a good transition is to go to product management and marketing because it's in between, you know, you're able to use your finance related background and you're starting to interface more with the end product and end customers. And that's where the bridge came for that. After I got into uh, sales, then the goal was how do you become an executive? And with that, it was, okay, what are the skills you need to uh, go attain? How do you make sure, especially being in sales, how do you make sure not only are you a good public speaker, how do you lead people, how do you manage situations? So I was always, again, trying to think five years out and now, and I say that five years, with the way technology is now, I'd probably have like a three-year goal because in five years, the world can change so much now. It might not even be feasible to think out five years, but... I try to think out anywhere from 18 months to three years and make sure that one, I got a goal, reverse engineer and think through what are the skills that I need to make sure I have. And just as important, who are the people I need to network and make sure that I understand uh, where things are going and how things are evolving and using your network to get what you're trying to get to. So those are some of the lessons that I've learned over the years and constantly apply uh, from a career standpoint. You know, if I were to take a guess, I, I presume you're probably uh, refining that last three year goal that you might have set pre COVID <laughs> with one that happened. Absolutely. So if um, if I look at as you made that transition from product management to sales, what were some of the difficulties that you might have experienced? Uh, in moving through those roles? Because I don't assume those positions just dropped out of thin air and landed on your desk. Yeah, I mean, look, the big thing was, um, again, I, early on, a lot of your, especially if you're in finance or those types of jobs, um, your work is the most important thing. Your end product is the most important thing. Um, product management, similarly, you want to make sure that you're putting out a good product. Sales? A lot of that has to do with how you present yourself. Uh, believe it or not, I don't know what you think of me. I'm very much an introvert. I, I, I like to be by myself. I like to do things by myself. But being in sales, you have to be able to articulate a vision, uh, articulate what you're trying to position with people. But most importantly, you need to be able to listen. Um, a young lady who actually worked for me taught me a lesson. She said, you got two ears and one mouth because you should listen twice as much as you talk. And that's going to be the most important thing in sales. And, you know, before that, I thought the most important thing in sales was being able to talk. But I quickly figured out that listening and being able to identify customers pain points and then bring a solution to them was the key. So, you know, uh, that solution 
is what we were doing in product management. So then, you know, you talked about the bridge to get there. It was really the biggest thing was learning how to listen so you don't go in and try to just sell something to someone. It's really listening so you could bring a solution to mm -hmm. a client. So that was probably the biggest transition. And once I figured that out, started doing OK in sales. Mm -hmm. So for your first job in sales, was there a particular product line that you managed? And, and then how did that you know, evolve the, over time to where you got to the point of leading a team? Yeah. Yeah, we were. So actually, I was leading a team and it was sort of funny. I uh, was a director of sales um, in the Philadelphia area. And one of the things that uh, my team was not complete, I probably had two sales manager openings. Um, so I had to play both that, that proverbial player coach. So I had to be the sales manager and the director. And it taught me a lot because um, at the time, the key products we were selling were uh, long distance, mobile phone and some data products. And as I said, it was a matter of how do, how do you go in and listen to what a customer is, uh, what problem are, or what is their pain point and what problem are they trying to solve? And then bring a uh, technology solution to them that would make sense for them and make sense for their business. Another thing you had to start listening for was um, how cost conscious were they? You know, is this a, is this a client that counts, pen we all count pennies, but you get the gist of what I'm trying to say around. Mm -hmm. Is it really about the cost? Is it about the new and emerging technology? What are they trying to do and what are they really trying to implement and solve for was real important. And one of the things that I had to learn early on was, um, you know, the best account exec, the best salesperson doesn't necessarily make the best sales manager because you had to be, know the difference between how do you close business? How do you coach individuals? All of those different things I had to learn on the fly. And it was a great learning experience. It's a uh, uh, I look, I learned more in the, you know, those couple years early on in sales than I learned a lot of my career because the last part of it is, you know, you gotta be uh, part psychologist when you're dealing with a lot of different salespeople and find out what motivates them and making sure that you're uh, feeding into what motivates them to make them the best salesperson that they can be. Yeah. So you're you're now in this sales director role. You mm -hmm. you acquiring all this information. You talked about the practical side of being a sales manager and director and being able to see all sides of it. Mm -hmm. uh, from that point on, as your career continues to grow, uh, presumably AT and T makes decisions about people based on performance, and mm -hmm. but performance is not all that is tied to. What are the key contributors that might have led to your subsequent promotions or what made you stand out? Yeah. Or, or yeah. was it just performance? Look, look, I mean, for um, and I tell people this that I mentor all the time. Performance is table stakes. <laughs> you you got to perform and be a high performer. And, you know, uh, as people of color, uh, minorities, things like that, um, you, you, you can buy into the we got to work twice as hard to be half is good. Look, you got to perform, period. So that's first and foremost. The next thing is, is your network. Your network may be as important as your performance, um, because when opportunities come up, if people don't know you, they're not going to take a chance on you. Um, from the Philadelphia area, I actually went and uh, became a branch manager in Pittsburgh. That came about because my former boss was the head of sales um, I jokingly say our Pittsburgh branch ranked number 34 out of 30 branches. That's how bad we were. And he gave me the opportunity because he was like, look, I trust you. I know you're going to be able to fix it. And it wasn't. Yeah, I always had good results, but it was I'm putting someone in place that I trust because uh, he didn't know what the problem was or what the challenge was there but he trusted me enough to give me that opportunity to go and fix it. And um, look, subsequently after that, yeah, I always put up good numbers, but it was who you know versus what you know that provided you a lot of opportunities in corporate environments and things like that. I happened to literally I was reading an article today around the uh, uh, lack of black executives 
uh, in the C-suite. And a lot of the conversation really centered on, hey, they uh, a lot of folks don't know the black executives, so they don't get the opportunity. So um, make no mistake that your network means a lot for you from an opportunity standpoint. Yeah, that's uh, and I've been doing a lot of similar reading and, and networking. I, I emphasize without question Heck, we know each other from networking, yeah. <laughs> you and yeah. I. And so Absolutely. It's, it's such a critical component that it's not just a function of how well you perform, that performance needs to be noticed. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have people who think of you mm -hmm. uh, when the right possibilities uh, do come about. So you do the you, you go out there to Pittsburgh, you knock out mm -hmm. the job as branch manager. What comes next after that? Uh, at the time, went back into what we called a product uh, director role, um, met, ran a couple of different businesses. At the time, I was running our uh, uh, managed services uh, data business, a uh, couple other business in, uh, uh, associated with that. From there, it was, um, it, it was sort of funny. Uh, if you live on the East Coast and it is mo late March, early April, I don't know if you're a golfer, but you want to get out and play golf. Mm -hmm. um, was out playing golf with one of my buddies who happened to be, I was his customer. So it was a customer event playing golf. And uh, this is the time when cell phones were really starting, but you still had voicemail. So, you know, every couple holes, you check your voicemail. <laughs> um, at about the third or fourth hole, I checked my voicemail. And the head of HR had called me and this was a this was a sister that I knew. So I didn't think much about it. You know, she was just probably calling to check on me. Um, we were at the eighth hole. And I remember this because we were coming up on the turn. And my boss, who never called and left voicemails for me, called and left me a voicemail. And I'm sitting there like these fools know I'm out playing golf and I'm about to get fired. So at the turn, I go into the clubhouse, take a shower, get to work. And uh, the HR person had a job for me. She wanted me to run corporate learning. And I'm like, why would you give me corporate learning? I know nothing about training. I know nothing about it. And it turns out two things. One, um, at the time, the largest uh, user of corporate training was the sales organization. Uh, the second piece of it was at the time we were thinking of outsourcing the function. So one, um, her biggest client, the head of sales was very comfortable with me because I had been in sales. So it was somebody I knew. So back to the network. And then the second thing was because I did not grow up in training, I did not have a lot of, uh, angst about outsourcing or looking at it differently because I would come from I would come to it from a business standpoint mm -hmm. and it ended up being another great uh, stepping stone from a career standpoint because one um, I got to learn how to outsource something and really deal with uh, all the way up to our board of directors in terms of outsourcing it um, the second thing was um, besides training I owned a uh, I owned our um, uh, develop, human development programs, human capital programs. So think of all your high potential programs. And not that I didn't value human capital before, but it really taught me the importance of investing in people and getting the most out of people. And it's something that I have uh, used ever since then in my career and trying to make a difference in how I manage people and how I lead people. So that assignment was one of the uh, seminal uh, events in my career. And as I mentioned earlier, back to snow, it always comes back to snow that I was trying to sneak out and play golf during the day where it wasn't snowing. So mm. uh, very important time in my career. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you take on this new role, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, is, was there a relocation of the company that? Still in New Jersey, was in New okay. Jersey. I moved from Pittsburgh to New Jersey, stayed in New Jersey for two or three years. Um, from there, actually moved down to uh, Washington, D.C., where I ran our uh, ran sales for our federal government business. So um, we're still moving around a lot. But at that time, the uh, moving from the product director job into the uh, 
uh, human resource job, which was my first VP job. So my first real executive job uh, mm -hmm. was in New Jersey. So it, it, it was quite a big deal, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it was it was it was a seminal point in my career. So, yes, it was a big, a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And so you 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 go from there. It's mm -hmm. what I call one of those aha moments. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure you got that call, and when it all dawned on you, like okay, this this mm -hmm. is I, I could be well on my way. Is how I kind of think about it. So yes, you do that job, and now you go into government sales. Talk to us about what that experience was like. Uh, totally different um, in that the way that the government procures goods, everything is based on a. Uh, uh, a open RFP request for proposal. Um, you know, the motivators that uh, a lot of our government uh, employees, including the military departments has is a little different than what you might find in an enterprise or retail client base. So I had to sort of retrain myself around uh, how you deal with customers, what their motivators are, and uh, making sure that I understand their drivers and being able to present a position and talk the language that they talk because uh, they talk a lot about the FAR, uh, federal acquisition regulations, things like that. So you had to go and learn uh, those new disciplines in, in the government sales organization. And what resources did you lean on to help sort of up educate you? Was it, you know, I know you mentioned that you always had people around you yep. were yep. there. You know, was there uh, other influences or were there educational tools that you leaned on? Um, well, it's, it's sort of funny. Besides the people around me, this was not that I didn't deal a lot with lawyers before, but I dealt a lot with our lawyers because the interpretation of the FAR and things like that, I can go and read it, which I mm -hmm. tried to do. But there were, you know, there's a lot of legalese in there that you have to go and get professional opinions on and making sure that you're interpreting it the correct way. So it was a lot of uh, it was a lot of reading. So, I mean, this was the Internet was there, but we weren't using it the way that we uh, use it today. Um, so getting books, going to the library and literally reeducating myself was real important at that time. Yeah. So at this point, you're moving up in your career. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still are you taking on new mentors or how are you getting sort of that edification or having sounding boards that can give you? sort of the, you know, qualified advice that you might need yeah. in an elevated sense. Yeah, yeah, it was, so So, um, this was a seminal time in my career because um, while I've worked at AT&T now for going on 30 years, um, the company was acquired. So this was thinking 2006, 2007, I was in DC um, and I didn't mention my wife and I, and more my wife than me, she always wanted to settle in the D.C. area. So had a great job there, was in the D.C. area. And it was sort of funny. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, go overseas to work or go to Dallas to work. And you mentioned mentors and things of that nature and, you know, timing being everything in life. Um, at the time, SBC... Southwestern Bell bought AT&T and took on the AT&T name. Um, when the acquisition occurred, um, I was identified as one of the executives that still had runway. And therefore there were a lot of people who were uh, from SBC that were getting to know me better. Um, one of the people that I had to, go lunch, had to go lunch with was a guy by the name of Randall Stevenson. I don't know who Randall Stevenson is. It's just a very nice man. Went to have lunch with him. Uh, not only was he the COO at the time, he was the heir apparent to become the CEO. And, you know, you find out subsequently after having lunch with him, there were a couple of key contracts that we needed to win in the federal government. And he told the head of uh, HR that after I win those deals, get him into his next job which would be an officer job at the company. And, you know, I, I was just having lunch as far as I was concerned, getting to know an individual. So, you know, always be on your P's and Q's when it comes to meeting with individuals. But um, yeah, I, I, at that time it was uh, meeting him, 
He's become a mentor to me. He's become an individual that I can go and confide in and get uh, career advice on, has helped me in my career subsequently. So um, those were the folks that at that time I was getting to know. And it was a it was a brand new company because being acquired, you know, you go and learn the new culture, you go and learn the new things that uh, you need to do to be successful in that environment. So at that time, I mentioned I was living in the D.C. area. We moved to Dallas, Texas. Um, as any good native Washingtonian, never thought I would live in Dallas. You know, that's purely enemy territory. But <laughs> moved down, I've moved down here and been now been here for shots. I this is going on 13 years now. 13 wow. years. So um, yeah, those were the folks you your it's sort of interesting. You always have mentors, you always have sponsors, and most likely it will evolve over time. And this was one of those times where my mentors and sponsors were evolving because of the change in the company landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I also, I know that for a lot of folks, when you get merged or acquired into another company, sometimes their culture uh, issues oh, yeah. that you have to reconcile. What, so what yes. was that transition like? I mean, you're, 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 you're becoming more visible. You're in a higher profile role. During those transitions, oftentimes a lot of people do get swept out. Mm -hmm. uh, or some mm -hmm. just decide, hey, the culture doesn't work. It's time for me to leave. What was that transitional period like for you? Yeah, I was very fortunate. So when I moved to Dallas, um, and and you know, and I, I have this philosophy. Um, there are three seminal things that could hurt you in your career: new job, new city, new job function. And I had all three of those at once. Moved to Dallas, um, moved into a new organization that I didn't know anybody. And it was a new function from the standpoint of while it was sales, the focus of it was more local access lines, which I had never sold before. So I had to learn all those different things at once. Um, so I was very fortunate and one, um, my admin was phenomenal in that she was the one that actually taught me a lot of uh, the cultural mores, taught me a lot of the things that I needed to know who are the important people, who are the connection points between people that you might not know knowingly that you need to make sure that uh, if you're position one, you might be you might be talking to one person, but you might really be talking to two people because they talk all the time. So she taught me a lot. And this is where and I learned this in sales early on. Look, the key to any decision maker is that guy or gal that's sitting outside their office. They could get you on their calendar. They could make sure that it's a positive time because if they're, you know, if they're a morning person, you want to be on their calendar in the morning as opposed to late in the afternoon. They control a lot of things. And I learned an, an important lesson from my secretary about, you know, who to connect with. What are some of the words? And, and you talk about culture. Um, most companies use acronyms and use certain words that if you don't know what they mean, it, it could be very it could be very confusing. And when I went, moved into this SBC culture, there were certain words that they use. I didn't know what they were. And I would literally have to come back to ask my secretary, hey, they said such and such. What does that mean? And look, by that time, there was Google and stuff like that. And I would go into my office and Google something and it wouldn't come up because it was something that was it was a lexicon that was used in the company. And she taught me a lot in that. So that was real important. And then uh, the people that were around me and it's it, 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 it was it's it's it was lovely how moving to Dallas, um, a lot of the black folks just wrapped their arms around me and made sure that I was going to be successful. They made sure I was going to be successful. They made sure I knew what I needed to know. They made sure that I uh, knew where the line landmines were, all those different types of things. So, um, you know, it's look your network, the people around you, it always comes back to that. I had to go work hard. I had to go learn stuff, but it was the people around me that surrounded me that whatever success I had, it was our success. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So you, you, you talked about that lunch meeting 
mm -hmm. take on this new role. I'm glad you mentioned how critical uh, uh, a role your uh, executive assistant uh, mm -hmm. played in that because oftentimes uh, people don't know that and people yeah. don't think about that. They think I've just got to get to the decision making, but the yeah. door, the, the gatekeepers really are the people who control their calendars sure. or they just the ones who know uh, vital information that can mm -hmm. be a critical uh, currency of exchange, especially within large uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two contracts you were supposed to win to get the next job <laughs> based on the discussion at lunch. Uh, did those happen and what became that next promotion for you? Uh, yes, they happened. Um, at the time, uh, the big one was, um, uh, it was called uh, Networks with X. And it was the uh, telecommunications vehicle for the federal government. Uh, that is a uh, uh, IDIQ, indefinite quantity, indef indefinite, uh, deliverable indefinite Delivery quantity, indefinite. where it's no no guaranteed money, but you have to be on the contract vehicle to win business. Sure. So we won that one for telecommunications. And then we won another one called Alliant, which was the same idea, um, but it was for professional services. So another big IDIQ. So once I won those, uh, moved down to Dallas where I was the head of our enterprise business for uh, our Southwest region. So think of Texas, uh, Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Arkansas. So running those five states um, only did that for, it, it wasn't even a year because we reorganized and I took over our uh, uh, government education and medical business nationally. So uh, we called it GEM, uh, Government Education Medical, um, which built on a lot of the things that I had learned in the federal government because the government aspect of it is uh, state and local governments yeah. Uh, the educational aspect of it included E-rate and the medical aspect of it included rural health care. So it's a lot of uh, government regulations that you have to follow. And, uh, well, you know, it was a great job because we I actually had the opportunity to put together five organizations because at the time, AT&T had just uh, SBC had acquired AT&T, then AT&T acquired um, Bell South which the real driver was that was putting together singular uh, wireless and ATT mobility to create one large uh, mobility organization. So at the time, I, I had the chance to pull together five different organizations at mm -hmm. one time and create a national organization. So I had a chance to learn a lot, had a chance to not only learn a lot, but see a lot of the country because at the time we had a uh, 22 state footprint, um, had to go out and meet with a lot of different people and make sure uh, that I had a good feel for um, what was going on in each of the organizations, each of the regions, and how do we drive more sales. So it was a really good experience. And uh, from there I actually went into customer service where not only it was for um, uh, the uh, United States, it was a global, scope job where I supported all 3 million of our uh, enterprise business customers and their service needs. So um, just had a chance to learn a lot and see the world. And I mean, for me, I was, you know, the kid from DC that growing up, you know, a trip was going to Philly or going to New York or going down to the country to North Carolina, something like that, where, you know, got a chance to see the world. So you, you now, you know, you've moved up even more. You're running um, a large segment, relatively speaking, of the business. Uh, you mentioned along the way that you eventually got to the point of running uh, your own PL. When did that occur and what, what was that transition uh, mm -hmm. point like? Yeah, the first PL I ran was the uh, gym organization. So I had PL responsibility for, and it's a, you know, um, multi billion dollar business. Um, from there, went to customer service. Uh, from there, ran our small and mid-sized business, which was an even larger P&L uh, responsibility. Um, from there, went back to running our public sector. So think of a, a federal government, state, local government, education uh, institutions, and also our wholesale business. So um, 
it's not always intuitive, but when I say it out loud, it makes perfect sense. AT&T's largest customers are Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, CenturyLink, because of the interconnect of the networks. So running the wholesale business uh, was a very, very large and strategic P&L for us and uh, did that for probably a year and a half, 18 months. Um, and now running our uh, public sector and our first net business is uh, what I'm focused on. And all of those, I have P&L responsibility. You sound like a very busy man. How do you... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> How do you uh, continue to maintain and strike a balance and still uh, make yourself available to your family? Yeah, uh, well, one, fr families first. I mean, so, I mean, you know, my family's my future, so that's where I start. Um, married to an amazing woman. Um, so believe me, I can't take credit for anything around the family. She, she is the uh, proverbial chairman and CEO of the Williams household. So make no mistake about that. So. Um, how I make it work is I follow directions very well. So that's how I make it work. But, um, you know, she's been uh, tantamount in building a house and a household and a home for us that I could be comfortable and do what I need to do at work um, and make sure that she has the kids, make sure that she has the things that need to uh, make the house run smoothly. But doing that um, my wife's also a pastor so she's juggling uh you know it's easy for me to juggle as many balls as i do because i watch her do even more so mm -hmm. um if she could do it i could do it is the way that i look at it yeah here wow that's incredible um you have a wife that's a pastor so that's even I more a, <laughs> yeah we, we started a church it's now been 10 years uh love nation uh we're now in hearst texas and uh, okay. yeah, that 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 has been that has been very <laughs> that has been the most probably the most seminal thing we've done in our lives is wow. opening and starting a church and, and running that, trying to be successful, and probably the most important thing around forget success is just being faithful around yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. If I could take you back in time, uh, mm -hmm. what advice might you offer to a twenty or thirty year old Xavier? Mm -hmm. Um, one, this, this is going to sound funny, but I'm very serious about this. Um, eat better, take care of yourself, period. I mean, I would start there because, um, and not just, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, physically, because, um, I, I think I saw something with Warren Buffett with some high school kids and said, you know, Hey, if you could buy one car, what would you buy? And then he said, if you could buy one car and it had to last the rest of your life, would that change your decision? Well, your body, <laughs> you get one body. Hmm. And if you're not putting the right fuel in it, and again, the physical fuel, the stuff you put in your mind, the stuff you put in your spirit, it, it's, it's not going to be good. So that is where I would start telling a younger person, a uh, younger Xavier that. Then the next thing is, um, not that I didn't value every relationship I ever had, but I would tell you to value it even more because that's gonna be the currency for whatever you do in life is those relationships and have you, and you know, um, I think I've treated everybody in a positive manner, but I would, I would go in knowing that I'm gonna treat everybody in a positive manner because you never know when paths are going to cross again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, implicit in that question almost is, are there certain things you might have done differently? I know you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, with the MBA rather than transitioning right out of college. Are there similar mm -hmm. things that come to mind that you might have done differently? Yeah, that's one. Um, the other thing I would have done, um, and I, I, I one thing I will say, I have no regrets. So let me be very clear. I have no regrets yeah. because I know everything builds off of, you know, everything builds off of everything else. Yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier, I had an opportunity to move to London or move to Dallas. I probably would have moved to London. I would have loved to have done a uh, overseas assignment. And not just for me. At the time, I think our kids were nine and three. 
I think that would have been so cool to have them lived in Europe for a couple of years. And not that they haven't seen a lot of, of look, they saw more of the world than I saw when I was growing up. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think it would have been cool to give them that experience and give my wife that experience. So again, no regret, but I, I yeah. probably would have thought about that differently. And to be very clear, the thought pattern was go to London on a lateral assignment or take a promotion into Dallas. So of course your, <laughs> your, your initial inclination, oh, I'm taking the promotion, I'm taking the promotion, but looking yeah. back and now being a little more worldly, it was like, you know what, taking the lateral, getting that experience, the promotion would have been there. The promotion would have been there anyway. Mm-hmm. Having the opportunity to go overseas might not always be there. So yeah. um, with, with age comes wisdom. With age comes wisdom. So absolutely, and that's part of why you know we have this podcast is to hopefully facilitate and foster information sharing. Uh, I'll share this with you. I interviewed um, uh, our fellow fraternity brother, who you know he's been retired for a few years now, mm-hmm. and he mentioned it at the time. The uh, fortuitous thing for him was he had a mentor, someone within the company, who eventually became their sponsor and said, "Hey, look." I see some potential for you in the future. And if or when the question does come up, we want to be able to answer that, yes, he's worked in a global role. He wound up becoming executive vice president at a large uh, technology company. He was retired now, served on the boards of PayPal and a few other boards. So so it's it's, it's very important information uh, that you're sharing because that's all part of it, uh, Mm -hmm. that information transfer. Mm-hmm. You've talked about, you know, obviously the important role that your wife played, some of the things that you uh, you think back and reflect on. Uh, as far as young people today or people at various stages in their career, uh, what are your thoughts around mentorships or sponsorships and how to extract mm-hmm. the most value from those types of relationships? So I uh, I am a big proponent of mentoring. I do it people around me probably say probably do it to my detriment from the vantage point I try to anybody I could touch I try to um first and foremost um and you I I love that you use the word mentor and sponsor there's a difference so one of the first things I try to make sure uh whenever I'm talking to a young person is they understand the difference um one of the things that I learned this when I was in grad school was um first and foremost your mentors choose you you don't choose your mentors so I have, I, you know, and I'm, I'm blessed when so many people come up to me and say, will you mentor me? Um, and I, you know, hey, like, look, let me tell you when you're asking about this, because um, the most valuable thing I really have in my life is my time. And I can't get, I, that's the one thing I can't recreate. I could miss out on money and I can make it up. If I miss out on time, I can't make that up. So. Um, I talk to people about if you want to be someone's mentee, um, make sure you're not going to waste their time. Um, make sure that one is not just going to be a one way street. What are you offering to them? How do you make sure you're adding value to them in some shape, form or fashion? So they look at it as a true relationship. Um, when I talk about mentorship, I talk about, look, I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you what I've learned. You have to understand where you are in your career. You have to understand where you are in your family. You have to understand certain things to make the best decision for you, because what's good for me might not be good for you. Um, Then I talked to him about sponsorship, because I said a lot of times those sponsors might not be people that you even know, know you. And there are a lot of times your mentor can be your sponsor, but in the exact same vein, um, a lot of times when people know that I mentor someone and I'm the one pushing for them, people view it as I have a hidden agenda. So where uh, you want to put me in a position where um, I know you know about Robert's Rules of Order, that I could be the seconder <laughs> of the motion. <laughs> I don't have to make the motion because if I second the motion, I argue it. So I, you need to make sure that you're you're uh, making enough connections that somebody else brings your name up. Once they bring your name up, I'm free to talk about you till the cows come home. So I try to make sure people understand those different things that 
Don't just bet your career on your mentor and try to make him or her your sponsor. You want to have a broad base of people that are able to represent who you are and what you're trying to do with your career. So those are some of the things that I always try to make sure young people, uh, heck, old people know from mm. this, you know, uh, corporate game and how the game is played. Yeah, yeah. So what's on the horizon for you and any closing remarks you might want to offer? Uh, look, on the horizon, uh, look, I just want to, two things. One, hit my God-given potential and pay it forward. I, you know, I, I've been very blessed and I want to make sure that um, the individuals that are coming behind me, that they don't have to do the same things I had to do. They don't have to fight the same fights that I fight so or have fought and, and hopefully have won. So, I mean, those are the two things that I'm really trying to do. Um, look, I, this is an incredible platform. So I want to congratulate you and thank you for what you're doing. So uh, I, I, I'm just humbled that you even had me on here. So thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely, man. This has been wonderful. One, it's great to learn your story. You've talked so much about the importance of networking and being connected with people. And amidst that, being on your P's and Q's, because you never know who's watching. You've talked about sure. the importance of timing and opportunity colliding for you. You've talked about the importance of family. And also importantly, even for young people, taking care of yourself, physically, mentally, spiritually. Absolutely. My guest today has been Xavier Williams. My name is Laudu Davis Yemitin, and you've been listening to My Brother Podcast.